will visit the last week before the recess week, and then we will also have a quiz after the first part. So hopefully, summarize what we have learned so far. It's not very difficult. Most things are on your notes already. So hopefully, we have an enjoyable quiz later. Multi-choice questions, only ten questions. Because normally we release marks immediately, but this time we have two students who ask for sick leave. Okay. Ten. Easy. All right. So first part, we still uh, review several questions we did not cover last week. So it just refresh your mind about what we studied last week. So this is a last week lecture. Some questions we, we did not practice, but it's very interesting. I want to start with this question first. To have a couple minutes, now you warm up a bit. Think about this question. We put it here, right after we introduce the concept of Lagrange multiplier. So this problem you might have have seen in your like high school or even primary school practice. And how do you do a, a interesting problem? You have a eclipse with this function defined, and then you want to maximize the the parameter of this rectangle within this shape. So if I give you such questions, are you able to use optimization to formulate it? You can use some mathematic foundations before to, to, to play with it, but in the, in the optimization way we recently learned, it's also a quite convenient and fast approach to solve this. So you, can, you might spend one or two minutes to think about this. Rx in this format is some ways you can use the operation to do that through mathematic operation because you know for the for the parameter to be maximized or for area to be maximized, this must be connecting points of the each of the nodes of the rectangle on the axis. So if this x and y will satisfy the relationship of this equation for this x squared plus 4y squared plus 4. This can be used to describe the outer shape, like this, this general format. Use break out for some general equation to describe a at least. And then if you do some operation between x and y, you will use the same cosine, it's one way to solve it. But here, if we use optimization way, this problem, how we formulate objective, is quite stated, clearly stated there. We want to maximize this parameter. So we know this, this 
nodes must be connecting on this outer shape to maximize its area or its parameter. So okay, we now we, we now know this point. This can be the x. This can be the y. So over row will be. This can be our objective function, right? Well, subject to the conditions that this function So this is an optimization way to write such a problem. Any questions for this? It's, it's clear, right? It's just directly writes the, what it's stated there. But if you want to solve it, you can use software. But this is a relatively easy example. It's only one constraint. So we studied here how we can use the Lagrange multiplier to change this problem. So if we define this new multiplier lambda here, we will then just write the statement to the new function L x y lambda to be the original objective <coughs> minus lambda multiplied by the constraints, right? Because it's just one equation constraint. This is standard way we turn this constraint optimization to one unconstrained optimization using this Lagrange multiplier. And then for this simple one, are we able to solve this by hand? If I give you such a question and you turn that to a new objective function, and then we, we follow the steps. We can force solve for the first order derivative. Because we have x, y, and lambda now, so we can do a. We know for the first order derivative, these are the necessary conditions for the optimization to be optimal. So we can directly do this to give you first equation, and second equation we do the first order derivative to a second variable, and then we also have this. Equality constraint holds. So we copy it here. Now we got three equations, and we have three unknown x, y, lambda. So it seems we add more complexity to it, but then we are really able to turn this to some solvable format. It's quite a built-in math. Then you just calculate this, it's become what? It's just the L over the x. To do this basic operation, it just four minus two lambda x, right? Because of y squared and the constants, these are not related to x, so these are <coughs> directly not copied in the first order deal, okay? For over dy become <coughs> y squared. So these are very simple equations then. You can just do the calculation to solve for this two and get a function value for your relationship of x and y. So if we continue to solve this, it will become Do a quick quick calculation yourself to see how do you solve such process. Are able to get the solution here? Function three exactly the same. Remember to use the previous e equation there. 
the equality constraints still have zero. So, so you can, in, in these two equations, you can actually use lambda to represent x and the y. Right, so you can write x and y in the format of lambda, and then bring them back to this equation. It's just basic operation substitute. <coughs> Process. You can you can do the whole process. I do this here for you just to show how smooth you can if you if you use this calculation process. No no longer need to use the, even the algorithm to solve optimization because if you want to initially want to solve this problem to to think about how how to maximize the function you might need either to write in the uh, in some format using the sign cosine or either you solve the optimization. But then using the Lagrange multiplier is able to turn the constraints into the unconstrained optimization and further solve it. So once you got your lambda, you got your x and the y and got your objective function. So this this is the way you can you can even use hand to solve it. That's a good question. Uh, so the Lagrange multiplier, what's the sort of physical significance of it? Because if we consider this as a real world problem with real... That's right. Yeah, so what does that translate into? We, we mentioned it a bit last time. Yeah, Anyone economics. you can, could think about an example, what does those lambda uv does mean? I read it's marginal cost. That's right. So the economic term, they call marginal price or a shadow price. Because you really multiply this term, to the constraints, so it means one unit of constraints you multiply this is price. It's like what unit of constraints multiplied by a price term here. Let's see, you add this price to the constraint. It means one unit if you increase the constraint to when you if it's active bounded constraint. For for equation it's always bounded. So if the bounded constraint move into one unit, they change this to this delta amount multiplied by this lambda. So this becomes the, the price you need to additionally pay to the objective function. This is a change in the objective function value added by the, the this, this marginal or shadow price. So it's sort of like delta area divided, I mean delta parameter divided by delta, like the right. width of the circle. Yes, you can think about in the realization way, it's kind of the, the okay. you, you move the constraint and then what's your change of your objective function. Right, okay. But it's also the way if we just use the define it, then it can be used to solve the problem while the constraint problem can be solved. All right, so this is just a sample to show you how to use it. And we also moved to consider the higher dimension when we have equality and inequality constraints. We then consider how do we turn those inequality constraints using the similar Lagrange multipliers as well. And now it becomes the KKT conditions. We have the series operation. Here, important concept is how, how do we decide if a constraint is active or inactive? <coughs> right, if it's inactive, then it means this constraint is not placed in a row. So, if you just write it in the KKT conditions in the format, it considers this new feasibility to form the complementary slightness conditions to decide either this constraint G is active or not by multiply G with, with a V, with, a, with a, another multiplier. Okay, so this is a standard form for to write KKT conditions. We got some 
computer how to write it earlier because some books they use uh, minimization, maximization, or they define the negative, positive. It doesn't matter. It will convert, will do a calculation in the end because you always turn that two equations. So just multiply both, turn the sign to of both your multiplier and your constraint is always the same. So it will not influence your, your final results. But in the process, it will just make it consistent if we define. So I write the whole process for you. In this case, we just define the turn it to minimization problem. Then we always have our general format with the minimization and the constraints written as smaller or equal. And then we are able to define the multipliers as non-positive values. So it's one way to write all the multipliers together. Uh, so the KKT conditions is just to check if the inequality constraints are active or inactive, right? This, this complementary slackness is used to check this. Because this complementary slackness variable is VGs to check the GX. But for the constraints, for the equality constraints, it's still the same as we started for equations. It's the same way as we used before. So first part is the same as equality constraint, and second part we add another complementary slackness. And then what's the purpose in formulating the KKT conditions for a problem? So when you have inequality constraints, then you have this way you can turn the inequality constraints even to the unconstrained problems. Because <coughs> all these are constraints. If you, you have constraints, the problem become quite difficult to solve in a numeric way. You have to consider feasible range it's algorithm there, but still it's easier to solve unconstrained optimization compared with a lot of constraints. So we try to turn all those constraints using the multipliers, using the KKT conditions to the objective function. So we revise the objective function instead of considering the constraints. So for the equations, we use the hx multiplied by lambda. And then for, the, for those inequality constraints, So the question is, can, for, for which one? For BK. Can, can it take any value or can it be? OK, that's, that's, that's a good, very good question. So here is a question here about the VK. Is a VK any value or it's, it's always a single value? It's a fixed value. Okay. So less than equal to 0. Is that the dual feasibility, feasibility so, here, right? if you can take any value then, then what is like the meaning behind that so uh, has has everyone on the same page about the question so here's a question about what's the value of vk what's the value of my multiplier <coughs> think about two different conditions if you have the uh, g like if this g is <coughs> active so means g is zero Right, if it's G, GK, this in quality constraint is zero, then your V value, it's really, <coughs> it's not acting as, as an effective value because it's just complementary <coughs> together to show one of them, one of V or G will be zero because their, their multiplication is zero. So when this constraint is funding, are active as g equals zero, this v can be a, can, you will not solve for a wide way in the end. So we won't solve for v1, v2, v3. So this is a solving strategy. You can try if you, you will be able to, to how many equations you'll get and how many function <coughs> values you'll get. I showed you the degree of freedom for this equation, right? Right, so for, for this one, if just for e equations, we'll always get the equations and unknowns, so we're able to use those methods to solve for it. But we will get the inequalities you can check the degree of freedom to see how we, if we are able to solve for exact value. Check the degree of freedom and see if we are able to solve for a value. So we assume the v's to be zero first, and then 
No, you cannot assume. Okay. So this, this will be, this will, is a sewing process <coughs> to be determined from, from this. If you see, in the end, it's not really to give you a, a, a set of the, it gives you a set of the functions. And then you, you, you decide from this set of, it's still some equations, some inequalities. So you can solve from this side of inequality. So tell if you are able to get a solution. Because it's these two different conditions. You will be able you will, you will need to discuss which conditions. So you, you will not directly solve for it for the results, but it gives you a, a turn this to an easy format for algorithm to continue to solve for it. Right, so we, we normally don't use hand to, to solve for those optimization with inequality constraint. It will be quite complex as well. But it gives you some criteria to tell if each constraint is bending or not. Okay, so that's a, that's a serious, serious part. But this part helps us to better understand that when we got constraints, how those constraints will influence my results. If it's an active constraint or it's not active. And then the final goal is really to formulate our problem. So last week we spent some time on the reactor design problem. It's quite a general type. When you get the mass balance, energy balance, you can formulate it step by step. Right, and we have provide you some ways to find the solutions. And in the last part, we didn't explain the details, but it, we actually have a, an actual, like can this, this level of difficulty can already be like an individual project because we, instead of one CSTR, now if we consider two reactors in a series. So this is example we did not cover last week, but it's, it's already here and the code is available. If you have two reactors, it's like a design problem. You have a series of reactors, you know the reactions and different kinetics, as you hear, and how do you write this optimization problem to maximize your productivity of the product? So it's the same way as a, as a first case, but now we have more constraints. Here, the, the conditions are stated here, but you, you will see the mass balance, and there's some constraints. It's already written as a constraint, but if you read the details in the paper, you'll be able to see these are some the volume constraints or some productivity constraints. So these are simplified constraints. When you do your design or you do your optimization process, these constraints will be there. You need to pay attention to your specific unit and turn that to the effective constraint considering the, the volume or the flow rate. So this is a final demonstration of the kind of optimization problem. If you're interested, you can check the code for, for this one. We have the code. This is for one reactor. This is for two reactors. So we write here, why we have such constraints if they have some residence time requirement, they have some of the volume requirements. Those are normally associated with a lot of engineering equations, some empirical equations. So they say its square must be smaller than certain value. So this will be your constraint for your, for your reactor design. And also pay attention to the range of your concentration and volume. So when you've got this kind of setup, you will be able to use the software to solve it. So if we see from uh, this week's slide, I give you this week's slide. We already put the code here because we want to show you a basic way. This is, may not be the optimal way to write the code. It's just a, very straightforward way to write formulate a GAMS problem. You find the objective function, find the concentration. Some <laughs> some of you sent me some some code to ask how to ask me to help you debug. So before you do that, I, I suggest you to debug yourself first. It's just you know programming is a very tedious process. If you write a, a comma wrong here, if you write some of the uh, brackets out, you miss the brackets. Oh, in, in Python, sometimes you miss the space. It will give you error message. 
and it seems very serious error message. You lost idea. You spent spend the whole day there. You don't know what happened. This is seems serious, but actually in program it may just be one symbol or just one comma. So that's very common. So you should like be more comfortable with those bugs, with those error message. For example, in games, if you if you run the code, it will give you some error message, even the LAN number. If you read your LST file, it will show okay LAN. Uh, 35 is error there. So just go to that line specifically to check if you write all the all those uh, comma or all those definition correctly. Right? So if you say after all the definition variables, you don't need this semicolon. After all these things, you will define a parameter, you need the, the slash. So those detailed errors, just, just, just be a little bit patient and until that, it will give you good results. You can feel the, the happiness when you, your, your code runs well. But the debug part is, is very normal. Just spend a bit of time to deal with that. OK, so this is a two reactor problem. If you want to study details, this can be a good case study. But we listed here, again, in the last part of the last week's lecture notes, how to solve optimization problems in the whole. Like, this can be in your project or can be in the real world scenario. If you have some example in industry applications, how do you solve that? So of course, first you need to analyze this process and list all the variables and the specific characteristics. Here is a good practice. You need to think about what is your objective, what is the things that can change that are varying those variables. You will be able to change them to a certain optimal value, and what are the parameters you cannot change. These are the physical parameters or just some characters for your process that cannot be changed. So list all of those things. In the games format, it's even just ask you to directly to think in this way, change, write down all your key numbers in this optimization problem. And then you determine the criteria for this optimization. I want to bring this profits as much as possible, or I want just reach certain level or de decide your criteria and then state spe specify the objective function. And third one, you need to formulate your variables. That will be your process model or can be the constraints. So this, is, this can be quite a large site, but make it feasible, make it reasonable at a certain level. And then if the problem is too large, we can break it to parts. Like you don't have to solve a huge problem. You can separate two parts, to so reactor parts, separation parts, and then solve for each sub problem first, and then make them together. If you want to really formulate a big one, I suggest you to start from the modularized one. Now it's easier just to start from smaller ones, and then use a data linkage between them. Or in the end, when you have each part, you can combine them together later. OK, so the fifth one, just to choose the technique. Here, choose the software. I choose some solar to solve it. And finally, it's check the results to make sure it's reasonable. And in the project, the discussion is also very important. You need to show what's the insight from the problem. Sometimes the results from the, you know, from the simulation is just give you results, but you need to judge to say it's reasonable. If the production level at a reasonable level, if all the constraints are, are, are met, if you write the things correctly, and normally when we do the like the research or some real application, we will do a sensitivity analysis. This is like when you have one parameter, you try to decide which parameter is most important. And when you make the problem, you, you may have some assumptions. You assume this is at this room temperature or this is kind of normal conditions. But this can be very sensitive. So say you increase one degree C, the whole whole process will will be ruined, will will not running. So those kinds of the Sensitivity analysis is very important when you get your final results. You can change the input parameters. The easy way, just you change different <coughs> levels. This is my business as euro, as my current parameter. What if I increase to two times the current level? Can be a high level scenario. What if it reduce to half, 50% of my current level? So this is like level-based sensitivity analysis, very simple. But more interestingly, there's some quite material technology, like Monte Carlo simulation. If you have, have heard of this, you can then generate some random numbers to your, just random numbers add to the input. 
and then see <coughs> the output based on these random numbers. It's very interesting to do a statistical analysis. If you have some parameters, you some assumptions, you don't know if you have confidence to define it. You can analyze when you get the first set of results. Okay, so this is the steps you, you might use for your projects and for your industry case study as well. In future, when you want to show its comprehensive case studies, you might just show a series of results. Don't just give a model, give a result, and say this is my suggestion. Normally, they like to want to see your analysis of the results and the different levels, why justification of why you made such assumptions. Okay, so the last part is I just give you some topics. It's from actually from last year because last year when we when we teach this course, it's the, just the time we got the speed. SpaceX rocket by Tesla at that night. So we, we, sh we show this example can be an optimization as well because in the aerospace, it's a lot of problems to, to be optimized. For control and optimization, if you think about the rocket or some a spaceship, when they do, the, the, they do the, the, some, the movement, the control part or the, the trajectory part can also be some optimization you want to as long as you have an objective if you want to minimize the, some mismatch minimize some arrow or to get this rocket from the initial position to a distance to to the target you want to minimize this distance so those things as long as you have an objective you can always use optimization approach to formulate it so that this example we, we want to minimize this this distance <coughs> But in the meanwhile, we have the process information. We, we have the velocity, we have different descriptions for the pathway for a rocket and give the initial condition, final condition. So this is a good example. If your background is in mechanical engineering, you can do. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to know uh, what kind of problem is this problem? I didn't know you can put uh, differential equations in the constraints as well. Uh, this one is, if you check the, the, the details here, this is uh, uh, not really to do the calculation, it's just to define the, the, the variable, variable, I believe. Sorry, I think it's just a variable. It's just define the variable, it's yeah. the name, it's not really do the calculation. In GAMS, it's, it's difficult to do the differential equations. So it's just a name, it's like a, you, def you can define the name in any way. Right, I, I got some questions to how do we use the differential equation or how can we use a machine learning model as constraints to your optimization. I, it's, it's, it's a challenging task. In research, we normally do something if you have a, a very complex model as a constraint or even black box model in your constraints, then how do you evaluate that? You can be a bit creative to come up with new ways, but in the existing framework, it's very difficult. Like, the differential equations are very expensive to be to be calculated. So you can use the, the MATLAB functions and get some look at tables, for example, and use a simplified regression to, to describe that as a simple way. But you can also think about some evaluation. You can write your own optimization algorithm, evaluation, make the evaluation at each time step using your differential equations. Like this example is also last year some students did to generate some optimization algorithm because optimization algorithms are really based on a lot of, the, of those like nature motivated phenomena like the genetic algorithm is based on how human evolves how human do the genetic mutation and do the evolvement so this this algorithm can be very effective because it's motivated by nature nature is very powerful in optimizing its its results in minimizing its energy so if you motivate by some of how nature do the process, how the natural process happens. Like this, a lot of algorithms are motivated by the heuristic thing. So this, um, uh, I think this last year some students did for some the algorithm based on the, the harmony process. But if you're interested, you can write some of the algorithm yourself as well. It's quite an interesting work. All right, so that's a last class recap. And then uh, some of you ask about the, the template for the individual project. It's actually on the IVLE already. I, I put it in there a long time ago. It's in the individual project folder. It's a template there. So if you... You, can, you 
you should use this, this template to write your project. No need to write a long one, just it has a five page for the main content. For your code, for your further uh, more visualization, it can be in the appendix. But for the main part, just show the required components. Right, so we have the criteria here. Topic selection, I hope you have already selected some topics linking to your uh, research or linking to your design project or just some very interesting project program to you. So the problem definition is very important. You, if you choose to review some literature, you should do a very good work in finding the relevant literature and say this is one important one you want to study. If you want to study one problem, justify this importance. And also it's like a report paper, it's like a research paper where you should give the context, the motivation, not just say how you do that, or step one, two, three, four, <coughs> step student's report. It's not enough. You always motivate yourself to say, why do I need to use optimization to study such problems? So introduction part, I quite, it's just writing, but I post 20 marks here just to motivate you to think about why you need to spend efforts studying such problems. And then the methodology part is just normal how, how do you formulate your problem and methodology, but also the results analysis and discussion. As we say, not just the one set of results, you like to discuss what those results mean. How, how can you make good realization? How many of the figures speak quite nice things about the results? And then for the analysis, you can do a sensitivity analysis of the results. And finally, finally, it's a report, how it's generally made a good report. Right, so uh, we also started to form the group project. This, this year we have 62, 63 in total, so I put the uh, each group will allow you, normal, the normal size is five people, but five to six is good. If you really have canal, the four is also acceptable, but we suggest you to go to six to make a group, to form uh, the group project, because it will be mainly for the second half of the project. So after we submit individual projects, after recess week, the, the second half of the semester, you will have some group project to do. So last year we also did the, the vote to say if you like to do that, get some freedom to do the self-defined group project, or you prefer, uh, I give you a consistent topic, so everyone work on the same topic. It will more like the urban system analysis for energy optimization, considering different technologies. <laughs> Think about it, we can do a quick vote. I'm not sure if you prefer more Freedom, or if you have also, if you have very good formulation, we can use yours to do the uh, to add a group project for everyone. So, the first come, first serve. You will have some, some very nice, very attractive topic. You can let me know. So, how many prefer the self defined group project? Self defined. <laughs> Okay, so it seems you have some good idea. Also, if you can let me know your self-defined topic, it will also be appreciated. But most of you still prefer a normal way to, to be giving a, a topic, right? But anyway, we will, we will decide this after the recess week. After you submit the individual project, I will relay the requirement for the final project. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you can start to formulate form your groups on IVLE already. I put the group list there. If you're ready, you can put your names anytime on the IVLE group. And then we move to some new content then, the linear programming. <laughs> will be the focus for today, the rise of the, the next 15 minutes, and also the, the lecture after recess week, we will continue with the linear programming. Because linear programming is really the 
the most widely used case in a lot of research problem, a lot of industry application. When it seems very complex, you you will be able to turn that to some <coughs> linear way. So linear way seems easy, but it's very useful. It's it's not that easy to solve. It has a lot of unsolved questions within as well, but it's it's very widely used in the industry applications because it's faster to solve. You will be able to get some global optimal results and within a reasonable time. So we try to formulate our problems simplify it or linearize it to a linear programming. <coughs> Just when we say that, then let's have a definition first. So what, how, how can we say a problem is linear? So this term may, may be quite familiar to you when you learn math. But this optimization model, we say it's linear program if it has only continuous variables. So with discrete variables later on, we say it's mixed integer. So it cannot just be say LP. Here we define the general, how we can say one problem is LP, linear programming. It needs to have only continuous variables. It has one single linear objective function and only linear equality or inequality constraints. So it's okay to have many constraints, but objectives only one. We will have more, we will call it multi-objective programming. We will also briefly talk MOO, multi-objective optimization. So it's no longer just LP, it becomes MOO. For LP, just one single objective, but you have many constraints, but they must be linear. So standard format, if we write it down, is because it's linear combination, you can use a matrix vector format to directly write down it. Just like a linear combination, you have your, your coefficients multiplied by your variable vector. So look at this kind of format. We have the objective, we write as minimization, and you have your xi or xj, you can write as a series of the uh, decision variables. So let's be consistent. Just follow this, which we use j here, actually. This is not the, if we just look at the, the standard notation, it doesn't, you can use any notation. Notation is just your way to show your model, but just be consistent, it will be fine. So if we have a series of decision variables, x, j, and for each of the decision variables, you have the coefficient in the cost function. So cost function is an obje objective function here in the description. You just have a combination of c, j, x, j, sum together and also you put your coefficient of the x i j in your main constraint you have i constraint and then the right hand side of constants will be your the vectors will be b because it's all linear combination so a matrix form works well if you have a function of, of A is 2 by 2, and then your X is, is 2 by 1 vector, you have 2X, then you got your B to also be the same shape of your X, so B is the right hand side to be either, it can be either equations or inequalities. So here we still write in the format, you can just directly write as the inequalities, but later on, we will show you if they turn, how we turn the inequalities to also equations, so it's easier to solve. Okay, and then you can have a number of main constraints and the number of decision variables. And also for all your decision variables, if it's normally we, we put it as bounded decision variables, it has a lower bound and upper bound. So this is a standard format of linear programming. So if you think about linear programming, it seems quite, uh, we're familiar with using it, but actually the history of optimization is not that long. It's only originated from the, the 1960s, 40s, when they have some, they start to think about how can we further improve our process. Now, but before that, they, they never use, people never use mathematics to, to really optimize the problem. We study physics, we study differential equations, like the Newton's methods, but not really to, to think about the linear programming to, to do the 
optimization problem in a linear format. But then from, from the 1930s, they simplex algorithm. So that they invented the simplex algorithm. It's quite close. Even some of our colleagues are, are basic students. So it's, it's still the persons around us, not, not really a long history, not some traditional things. It's some new knowledge, new domains here. And they, during the war, this optimization really starts to play a role. In like, the Second World War, they have faced a lot of problems. How do we do the military logistics? So this is a very classic example when they have some, it's, it's during a war when Berlin is blockage and they only have limited airplanes to transport the results, but they must feed all the people who are who, who got stuck there. So then they, they got the hair, the mathematician to say, okay, how do we plan the transportation of our airplane to make sure we just use the, the minimal results, the minimal like airplanes to sponsor all the people in this block in the blockage. <coughs> so that, that's a that's the time when the optimization linear programming started to boom to be really useful by more and more people. And then they start to, uh, I think these problems are also this thought by you, by, by some projects, you, you think about the Dell program, nutrition, how do you guarantee your, your required nutrition is, is satisfied, and also your, you want to minimize the calorie or minimize the cost. So that's, that's some problem they also studied. And also in energy process, they have a lot of people doing optimization in oil and the gas or in the smart grid nowadays because the whole process can be improved a lot. We will see some marginal improvement in one process. We'll turn that to the annual cost to the, for the whole plant. It can be millions, billions of dollars for, for the whole process. So these are widely applied. And also for the operation research for air plant crew assignments, the vehicle routine, it can also be regarded as optimization and linear optimization. So the control, control theory you have learned in year three is a lot in your organization as well. Okay, so it's, it's quite a lot of uh, algorithms developed in the past, but the most commonly used two are simplex and interior point methods. Even those interior point methods was thinking back in the 1990s, so it's still not too, too, too long ago. But this method nowadays is more commonly used. So now if you think of better methods, still an emerging field, you can still come up with optimization fundamental methods to contribute to a community. Okay. So what we understand what the problem, how, how the formulation is in the mathematical science, then how we turn those applications into the LP models. So let's say, say the formulation refers to the construction of LP models of real problem. It's not really any fixed laws. It's, it's really some R's or experience-based R's. You can have all ways of formulation to your linear programming problem. If you want to use the, the, the convenience of linear programming, you can do the, the formulation. Think about how do you formulate a problem. So basic steps is still the same. You need to define your system, go to your system boundary, what you will study. Identify the variables, the decision variables, design variables, and then express the constraints of the problem. Here it must be linear equations or inequations. So of course the word is not linear, it's not always from a straight line connecting all the points. But when you formulate, it's always based on some assumptions. You have unit price multiplied by the quantity and give you the total cost. So those kind of the the linear linear concept can be helpful in formulating the LP models. Also, your objective function also need to be linearized. It's either maximized or minimized, but it's a linear function here. So why, why do we need to the LP formulation? It really brings the convenience. There are lots of the material theories and technology. Later on, we may study more of the, like the nonlinear mixed integer, even mixed integer nonlinear. Those methods are, are not really solvable by the existing solvers. If you formulate the problem ideally, perfectly matching the real world, in the mathematic world, it's not able to be solved by computer. So that, that how, also how, why nowadays the machine learning data-driven approach become more appealing because you can turn everything without knowing the mathematics, without knowing it's 
underlying fundamentals. Just use data to describe it. So you can describe any system, just throw it to a black box model and train the computer. But here we, we study optimization, we need to formulate the process model. We need to describe the process. And if you describe it in a nonlinear way, it's difficult to solve. But a linear way is better. You have a lot of commercial software to solve in a very large scale problem. Sometimes we study linear problem for like this urban scale simulation, it's millions of variables. But it's very fast, you can think about within seconds. You try some examples already, within seconds you are able to get your results. So it's quite good for the online optimization. If you have a dynamic environment, it's always changing. But if you do it at kind of real time, it will be very fastly sold using a linear programming way. And also the data variation or sensitivity analysis can be quite handled in the material structure. Because it's it, you, it, the model is very clear. You know it's A plus B to, to multiply by, by another constant. So this structure is very clear. You can see the LP format and then do a sensitivity analysis. So it's all the advantage of, of LP. But then let's, let's also uh, look at some examples. These are just <coughs> can be some realistic examples if you derive them from the, the complex real world problem. Have a look at this one. So it's a manufacturing facility which produced two different products, just two. Product one and the product two. And they have two types of machine, A and B. So this can be very common for manufacturing or even for some small scale enterprise. If machine A operates 15 hours per day and the machine B 24 hours per day. But the total tuning time cannot exceed five hours. The processing time and the tuning time for producing one unit of each product are reported below. So it has two times, the tuning time to get machine ready and the process time to really do the manufacturing. And the unit profits are given here. So if they want to determine the optimal daily production in order to make, maximize the total profit, You can write down the problem formulation using your way, your preferred way of this problem.
relatively straightforward formulation because in the statement, every sentence is carrying some information. Really, so it's two products, so you know, okay, I, I may have two decision variables because I need to decide the productivity, the daily production for each product. <coughs> and then I got my objective function quite well defined here. I want to maximize the total profit. So if you look at the problem, you define your production, daily production x1 and x2 first, and then the total daily profit can be directly multiplied by the unit profit given here. So it's 2x1 plus x2. So it's clearly stated here, if you do some of your real world problem, you need to find those parameters yourself, but then you will be able to write down the formulation. And the constraints here, are mainly by the machine time, I stated. So it, it did not consider all the complex uh, constraints. If you have a power size that has a lot of mass balance, energy balance, or more market constraints, that must be there. But in this case, it just consider the machine time and tuning time, just two sets of times. Right, so it gives you the machine A because product one does not use any machine time of A, if only product two. So you are able to write 5x2 smaller or equal than the upper limit. But for machine B, both product will use the machine time. So unit machine time is 6 plus 2, 6x1 plus 2x2, smaller or equal than the upper bound. So see, when you write it in a table format, it's already the matrix. The table one gives you a good sense of the of the coefficients and the limit of your of your matrix. You got the the daily upper bound here, and also the tuning time because the machine needs some start up or some shutdown phase. So the tuning time for this is also clearly stated here. So in when you formulate a problem, if you think about start up, it may be very complex. It's nonlinear, dynamic. You have to start from the, the this temperature to that temperature and a lot of complexity. But when you solve optimization, you can do simplification here. The thing about this startup phase is equivalent to certain time and certain cost. So in that way, you just put this constraint on the startup stage to be the tuning time or to be the, the total loss because the product to produce from the startup phase may not be the <coughs> The, pro the satisfactory product is off spike. So those are the loss function you have. So you can put the constraint here. It's tuning time must be smaller or equal than five, or total loss must be something. And in the end, it's very important you remember to constrain your variables. Here, the x1, x2, it's a production, daily production. It must be zero or positive. So it's non-negative constraints. So in this way, you just write this formulation in this very neat linear format. And using this format, you will be easily able to solve for the results. Right, so even using hands, we are able to do, but computers can give us much faster job to solve this very simple formulation. Okay, so that's for uh, like a kind of a, just a normal machine cleaning machine. But if we consider, this is also a typical example. If we consider blending model, the so blending model is very useful in all the industries, like in oil and gas, in chemicals. And here we, we consider, this is a, the blending of several different feed stock. So if we want to create this animal feed mix by blending the three ingredients, so this leads to what the guest lecture gave us the talk before. If they have a lot of waste, we want to recover the waste. They're not doing that in their own business already, but they seldom think about how do they optimize it. Nobody just makes what's existing there. But as an experienced engineer, they know how to do the mixture. But as a well-educated chemical engineer, you should be able to do some very basic calculation before you take the actions. So if we got some ingredients here, we have lemon stone, corn, soybeans, normally to make together the animal feed. 
if we want to blend them together and we know these properties given here so for each kg of the ingredients it contains this amount of calcium protein and fiber as listed in the table well for each kg you need cows is given here and how do you formulate this linear programming model to decide the optimal amount of each ingredient of the three that will minimize the cows also satisfying the composition restrictions so for calcium protein and fiber is some constraints here so from this problem again to write down your your equations your your optimization formulations Our general model you can use this kind of formulation for any blending, any mixing formulation. Here we have three ingredients. So how many DC variables? Straightforward. We want to decide the three proportion. So as a percentage value or as a proportion, as a as a portion of the total. We want to decide the optimal amount of the three ingredients that minimize a cost. Okay, the cost is the object, objective here. Previous one, they are giving the daily profits. So we want to maximize the profit. So again, when you formulate the problem, remember the important. How do you write? This is confusing to many engineering people. What is profit? What is revenue, what is cost. But this is like the fundamental equation the business people every day deal with, right? So they, they, when they do consulting, they always start with this equation. Your profit equals your revenue minus your cost. Right, so this is, a, this is this, like, if you know this equation, you can, you can even be a consultant economics. Economics, like maybe a consultant to suggest, make some suggestions 
If you want to be more profitable, you can increase your revenue, get more product channel, get larger market, or you can reduce your cows, sell for cheaper ingredients, and get more, more, more reasonable supply chain. So those are the very uh, fundamental underlying for economic optimization. But in many of the problem formulation, we always consider either to maximize the profit or to maximize the uh, uh, revenue or to minimize the cost. So it's always those kind of economic optimization based on what you are giving or what information you, you will be able to get. But, uh, again, when you divide down, the revenue will be unit price multiplied by the quantity. So you can give more suggestions, say the price, what the market price, this is the information you will be able to obtain, and the quantity can be your estimation of how many you can sell, because this is sold the quantity, how, how many components you can sell, or based on historical trends, it's a lot forecasting model you do. So the first step is to analyze the market and get the forecasting for the sales to get the, the quantity. So this is like the, the framework when you optimize something, you need to think about what's the available information. And if information is not there, how do you predict it? How do you build, build this data gap using the model? We use now, a lot of machine learning models are useful for prediction. For this market fluctuation, you can use a lot of the statistics of, of machine learning models we can to forecast the quantity. But in this simple case, you're giving all the numbers already. So just do the formulation. Here we want to minimize the cost. Well, we know the cost here. Unit cost are 10, 30, 90. So we just write down the objective function. And then we write down all those constraints. What's the first one? It's for calcium, it's at least 0.8 percentage. The percentage is turned to 0 0.008, but at most 1.2. So it will be bounded on both sides. Has lower limit, upper limit, <coughs> but you define the three X. So for easier <coughs> understanding, you can write the, the sub, subscript as XL, XC, XS for three components for the for LCS. And then you got the calcium, you got the protein must be larger or equal than 22%. And fiber is also at most. So here is, is a word, at least, at most. These words will, will be translated to your smaller or uh, to, to your larger or equal, smaller or equal. So those pay attention to those words, it will be the constraints to your model. Right, so this uh, first three are exactly the constraints for the three components, the criteria it must be given. But it is really three, you think about, when you look at the first three, it has three constraints you saw, or it's actually four constraints, right? But although you write this as lower bound, upper bound, when you saw it, you had to quantify it. First, by this must be equal or larger than this value. And secondly, it must be smaller or equal than this value. So when you write it in the computer provide, pay attention. You cannot write it in this way. Computer is not processing information. In This is too complex to computer already. So it prefers the information just by equation, equation. So this actually are just four constraints for these two sentences. Okay. So here, an important formulation information is when we sum up the three x, it must sum up total one. So this is some information you, you, you miss sometimes. If you don't put this constraint, it will go quite large number and you're happy, okay, the, the count the, is, is good. You have a lot amount of good results. But this, because this is a percentage value, so when it makes some composition, when it comes to some mixing, you always sum all the x to be together to one. And this is what, in this way, because we formulate straightforward, it's also when you have those equations, 
you can actually just have two theta variables of x1, x2, but the third one will just equal to the rest, will be equal to 1 minus x1 minus x2. So it's also an easier way to formulate and to solve it. That's why we love equations. It's, it's really able to give us directly solving strategies. And also the three x are bounded, so they are non-negative values. They're the composition. So we put the equal or larger than zero here. So this is the formulation for a common <coughs> mixing problem. With this formulation, we'll be able to solve it later. Right, so last one, I also put another example. This one is relatively more complex. We won't go to the details for now, but it's already the operations planning. I did not put all the details here, but I think it's, it's very common problem in operation research. If you got some feed to your plant, you got some output of product, and for each feed, it has a mass balance to turn to the final product. For the combination, you got this, and for feed, you have cows, then you have the uh, constraint for capacity. Well, for the constraints, you have a lot of the constraints for for the output, you have constraints for product. So this is a, a when you study the whole plant operation, this is a typical OR operation research problem. So we, we give you a solution, but you can you can think about formulation process. So if we want to decide how much of the feed we, we should we use, feed one and the <coughs> For two, in order to get the three product. So this this here the objective function is what we we, we indicated here. We show that profit equals the total revenue minus cost, but the total revenue are linked to the three products you you sell. You are able to get those three products, and for each product is a sales price. So this is the revenue you will collect from the plant. But you also have the cost term that is here we only consider the raw material cost. That's a fit two feet stock. But in your engineering optimization, you engineering economics, you have all your cost terms considered. It's capital investment to build the plant, operational cost, the raw material cost. So it's a series of the cost terms you, you can consider in your, your design problem. You might, some of you might, might have been doing this. So it's a lot of cost terms to be accounted here, but in optimization, you can translate that to some unit cost and then minus this cost term. And then in the constraints, it's a similar approach. You got your product, it's actually my balance. You got your output equals <coughs> the usage of input. So this F and P are Actually, the x in, in your decision variables, you just indicate here as f and p, but as you see, these are your decision variables. You can write it as x1 to x5 or x, x sub, sub, sub side. So this, after the three equations for the mass balance, you also got the final product has a certain range and your fixed style has a certain range. So it's, it's a lot very simplified operation research. And one good message for you to think about is what are additional issues to be included in the model. It's allowed because it's a real plant operation for the optimization of to, to <coughs> maximize your profits. You can use this basic framework to add a lot of the constraints if you want to do the operation. But one thing here is what's missing here. Probably too much things missing, so it's difficult to say. But it's like, first of all, this is static, stat, like static way to describe the process. You did not consider any of the time yet, any of the time relevant information yet. We always give you this is a this is a unit price, this is the amount. But in the real formulation, time is very important. You always want to study a dynamic way, but not just use dynamic programming, which is quite expensive. You can use the dynamic terms here, this 
you could capture this as a, as a snapshot. This is the current time, but in the next time step, it will change to another side. Or if you consider this as a yearly profit, or seasonal variations, <coughs> or it's a daily profit, or it's hourly operation. So this, this needs to be clearly defined. We did not really mention the time steps there, but in your own projects, when you do this economic optimization time, the dynamic terms are very important. So you should clarify what is your scale, what is your focus time frame. Location here is just one single site. But normally when they do the optimization, what's the time? What's the spatial criteria? Like just consider one plant or consider this whole region or this whole supply chain, this whole city. All those problems are need to be clearly defined. Okay. And also the energy balance is not evaluated here, and some environmental impact is not mentioned. So those can be more and more realistic factors that will influence your, your operation problem. So based on this simple structure, you can add more and more. Right, so let's just give you a sense of what is LP. So the following part is we start at the beginning with the LP theory and the algorithms. We, we not go to details in this lecture, but just give you some sense of what's possible ways to solve it. So we, we did not use the textbook yet in, in the class, but actually the book has a very comprehensive explanation, especially for algorithm, for theories. If you have time to understand more, you can read the chapter four in this PDF, <coughs> in the RRR book, it gives you a lot of details about optimization, or through the, the, this PDF, also some examples to give you more sense. But we want to start from the basics of LP. We just introduced, it has only continuous variables, a single linear objective function, and only linear equality or inequality constraints, right? So we write in the standard way. And then, Whenever we got constraints, we got to the concept of a feasible point or feasible region. Because we discussed just now, we turn those inequality constraints or equality constraints to describe some space. And this makes a feasible point ensemble. So here we see a feasible point of one LP, like all these points here. It's said to be an extreme point, or we call it color point, or a vertex. If, so, so first of all, let's read this sentence. We say, one, first of all, it must be a feasible point that meets all the constraints we define as a feasible point. So if in this figure, can you tell what are the feasible points? So all the, all the boundaries, if we use the line to describe the constraints, all the boundaries and the yellow space make together all feasible solutions. So feasible just means it meets all the constraints. Not necessarily optimal, but it's a feasible point. And among all these feasible points, we can say it is an extreme point. If every line segment in the feasible region containing it, also has a point as an end point. So it's a bit uh, complex to state it, but in the figure it's very simple. Just say these extreme points, like these spikes, are how are extreme points are vertex. So these are the important points in linear programming. So here we can visualize it because it's a 2D space. You only have x1 and x2, and then you have an objective function here. You can write some of this, draw some 3D visualization. But in most problems, we have quite loud dimensions. Even the, the simple one, we only have three. So you no longer can draw it. If you just draw it and compute the extreme points, you're able to get some direct sense of the value. But in the larger, Problem. We have millions of space, but how do you tell that points are important? That is the definition. If every line in the feasible region <coughs> has which which the lens has this point, always has this point as an end point. So these points will be our extreme point. So this is very important. 
So these are the points that stick out. We just give definition of these points first. It's a basic definition of LP. And then these are the fundamental properties. Why we study linear programming? Why we want to formulate as LP? Because it's this feature. So it's here, every local optimum for the linear programming for LP is a global optimum. So this is the most important feature because we have the confidence to say if we solve for this local optimum, it will be our global optimum. And also, LP, if it has a, a non-constant objective function, then this optimal solution cannot be in the interior of the feasible region. <coughs> what does this mean? So it means unless all those function values are the same, all those points are optimal, are equally optimal. So they, they can be any optimal solutions. But if this has a non-constant objective function, if it has an optimal, unique optimal solutions, those solutions must be on the special points, at least not, not in the interior points. So those yellow space we defined within the space are interior points. So the optimal solution won't be fall on those yellow space here. So if we say that LP has a unique optimal solution, then that optimal must occur at this extreme point of the feasible region. It's not in the interior, it must be at the extreme points, as we say, those vertex points. So if an LP has multiple, multiple, multiple optimal solutions, then one of them must occur at, at extreme points of the feasible region. So that's why it's a bit tricky, just, just we can explain it later, but it has more than one optimal solutions, then it must be some solutions on the on the extreme point. And the others, they, they can be the same value as this optimal solution. It can fall within, but at least one must be at the extreme point. What do you mean by a non-constant objective function? So that it really means you don't have to optimize it. It's, it's just you whatever you you do, you always got the same profit. So it's in, in the mathematic term, it's the constant value. It's kind of the station surface for your for your objective function. It's not very common. In that case, you don't have two. It's just because this is mathematic definition, so it's very precise. You just need to see the definition first. When, when we solve it, we may not, we, we may never think about how, what's the fundamentals. But this is a definition stage. We just pay attention to what is the properties of that? All right, so we, we may just look at the algorithm and from next week, next week we will focus on the algorithm part. It's also a bit difficult to understand the algorithms, but when you use the algorithms in the software, you should get a sense how it is generally done. As, as we say, all the optimal points will occur at the extreme Point. This can be proved, but we, we don't spend time on the proof here. If you want to read, you can find yourself to prove that. But those extreme points are, are able, it's, it's now it's a finite number. So the naive method is that we can calculate the objective function value at every possible extreme point. And just keep whatever feasible, keep, choose all those feasible values and choose the best one, choose the optimal value. That's a straightforward algorithm. Calculate everything. It's like the random search methods we discussed before. You just search the whole space and uh, compile which one's bigger, choose that one. And then consider how, how many rounds of calculation you will need to do. Your calculation time will just be the total number, the maximum number of your three points. So it's quite a huge amount of computation results. Of course, we won't do this as a naive method. For simple problem, it's okay, but we won't, you can even draw a line and uh, find the proper points. But for algorithms, we will use a lot of numeric optimization to search for optimal solution. So those two figures plugged here are the two methods most commonly used. It's also an iterative search method. 
So if we look at the, each of that, it's general idea for optimization is always the same. It's to use the iterative scheme and then determine a, a direction to move and then say that's the right direction and to, to compile results and uh, if you improve the objective function value, continue to search. So this is this part just to give you a, a general framework of all the searching algorithm. How do you start from x0 and then find a direction, you only use the local information, and then find an iterative scheme, you write the code in this way. You find the feasible, we see the feasible region, you find the next point, and then calculate the value if you increase the value, if the satisfactory increasing or decreasing, depending on your maximizing or minimizing, you, you choose to go that direction or not. So it's, it's like a numeric way to, for n general, right? for LP problems, it's two classic way. The one way is to start from the inter, from, from the internal region, to the point, any point to start, and then determine the improving direction. So this is the basic idea, just similar as a Newton search we did before, but you search, here is LP, you just search some directions until you reach this optimal point. So we can introduce the algorithm later. But just general idea is to start <coughs> from some interior point. But the another method is simplex method. It's even more uh, useful for smaller scale problems. You can directly move along the edge. You don't have to consider, but initially just start from one edge and then move across all the edges and then just find the, all the points. That gives you the the final convergence to get optimal solution. Those are the two. We will spend some time next week to show you some basic algorithm. How do we do this? These two methods, right? So that's uh, what we will do when we come back from the recess week. But I will quickly show you how do we do the linear optimization in the software because you might need to use this in for your project, right? So it's, you can read already. It's, it's also games, might lie, but you can all use any software. Any software that's so optimization will be able to serve linear. But Lindo are those kind of designed for linear programming can also be used. Right, and MATLAB has a toolbox called linear programming that is very powerful for all the algorithms you can use. So it has also the specified format. You just put all the matrix vector found to and use the lean program. It will give you the solution. But if you want to solve a larger scale problem, like games can, can be better, you still use the same way. Use parameter, variables, and define the equations and model for O to solve it. But here it's just if you know it's linear programming, you're just using LP, minimizing of maximizing the function. So this is a GAMS code we write. GAMS code is doesn't differentiate allowed. Just here is LP. If it's integer, it's maybe I'm IP. So that's that's a point differentiate what the program is. Okay, so we will come back next week. But for now we just stop here. And for the quiz later we start from 8 p.m. sharp, but it's not here, it's in the computer room. I think other graduate students have used that before, right? So teaching cluster five and the six. So uh, it needs a card access now. All the UG students have access during night, right? You should have access. But for PG, if you don't have access, uh, the TA is coming to get you to, to that way. You can go with, with the TA later, or just go with the it's, a because it's not in the same building. It's, it's in the same building, but still across the, the way downstairs to the cluster five and the six. You know the way. They're very clear of the way. So if you don't know a way, you can you can uh, wait a minute and we can go there together. But it's a computer lab, teaching lab, five and the six.